My name's Oli Davu and I'm exec chef at Hyde Restaurant. So I always knew I wanted to be a chef and uh, I started cooking professionally. As soon as I finished my A-levels, I went to Raymond Blanc's Le Manoir Cat Saison in Oxfordshire, started at the bottom, worked my way up, then progressed to work for other uh, Michelin star establishments, so Hibiscus uh, and Texture, Starge de Noma Fat Duck, Magritte's Lastrance, WD50 Pierre Gagnier, um, and I set up my own restaurant, Debu, had that for about five, five six years. Um, which won a Michelin star, and then saw the site for Hyde, which was too compelling uh, to deny, and we, we moved the team over, and we've been here now for about two and a half years. So from a, from a flavour point of view, uh, can you describe your journey from starting off at somewhere so classically mm. French, and how do you find yourself transitioning to where you are now? Yeah, um, it's actually maybe less of a journey than, than it sounds going from you know, classic French to, to the style of food that we do at Hyde, because overwhelmingly, rather than being French food, the, the food at Le Manoir had a, had a purity of flavor and a kind of element of kind of truth to it. So tomatoes, taste of tomato, lamb, taste of lamb. So that was the, the kind of overriding um, kind of principle there. And one I've carried forwards, I think, as you, as you get older, you prefer things to be simpler. And I think that, effortlessness and, and clarity of flavour is, is what I strive to, to achieve and combine it with elements of charm or theatricality as, as you go through a tasting menu. So how would you describe Hyde as it is today? Oh, good question, <laughs> one I probably can't answer very yeah. well, but uh, I'd say sophistication through simplicity would be how I'd sort of sum it up. Nice. Um, so the flavours that, that are inside your dishes, mm. um, obviously with your French roots from a cooking perspective, yeah. can you describe how you're building flavours into things um, today? Yeah, well actually it's, I guess my approach today is, isn't that classic in that um, uh, trying to use a minimum number of ingredients so they all just taste of themselves rather than trying to imbue a lot of different flavours into something. Um, so. A lot of the recipes are actually very pared back and a lot simpler than what what people imagine. Um, so it's it's I think trying to keep things as as fresh as possible. So um, almost try and use less less processing. Le you know, because sometimes when you cook an ingredient, you almost lose a little bit of flavour each time. So I want to keep that magnificence and celebrate its natural state. It's often that actually means doing doing less to it, but maybe in a more nuanced manner. Okay, so when you're trying to build flavor mm. into to these simple ingredients, mm. it's obviously not as simple as it sounds. It is, <laughs> otherwise everyone would do it and I'd be out of a job. So yeah, I think it's just knowing what goes with what, knowing uh, kind of when to, when to stop, when to stop adding things, um, using the very best ingredients and just showcasing them. So when you've got amazing raw product, it's, you know, makes, makes the chef's job um, a lot easier. Summertime, you probably need to do less to ingredients. Wintertime, sometimes, you know, people want to eat a little bit more heartily. So there's actually more cooking that goes on in the winter than, than in the summer. I think it's one of these innate, touches that comes with 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 being a chef where where you 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 know what things need to make them shine as you're trying to build these flavors up and you're trying to make a tomato taste more like a tomato mm, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so we're interested to talk about uh, Japanese flavors and sure. obviously we're not in a Japanese restaurant so that seems strange to a lot of people mm. um, so can you Explain to me how you think that using Japanese ingredients in a non-Japanese environment benefits your dishes. Yeah, um, I think I'm probably not constrained by uh, a traditional perspective. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm willing to probably bastardize ingredients as I see fit, um, which can be, yeah, can, be, can be liberating. It's not meant to be out of disrespect. Um, so, you know, we use a lot of dashi as a base stock. I love the kind of the clean, there's always like neutrality to it. Um, as, as a base, then, you know, dashi vinegars, seaweeds, all these things, they, um, you know, it, it adds a layer of umami a lot of the time. And uh, 
the clarity of flavor of, of Japanese food, I love. And you can harness some of those ingredients uh, to showcase Western ingredients as well as a, as a complement or seasoning to them. Would you say that with the Japanese ingredients, they're easy to pick out within flavors? Or could you say that you could either make them stand out or you can sort of build them as hidden layers underneath things? Yeah, I'd say you can use them for both, um, in both manners. Um, so certain, certain flavors, that sort of umami is, they kind of base notes that give a real fullness of flavor um, without being maybe clearly definable. Then there's other things that give pop, so that Sancho pepper, pickle ginger, kinomi leaf, all these different things. You've got the kind of top notes and, and the base notes, and usually a dish has a little bit of both. So you could say that you're adding an extra dimension with this without changing the purity of the original absolutely, idea? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it might be that the core ingredients uh, are European, could, could be British, could be French, but yeah, using these, you know, the umami and the, the pops, they could just add, add the, uh, the, the cherry on top as such. Brilliant. So if we're just talking about Japanese ingredients in general, mm -hmm. is there one ingredient out of the many that are available that really sort of stands out? And if you can remember from that, what was the first time you used it or applied it within? Yeah, something? no, um, bit of a random one, but uh, kinomi leaf. So it's hugely expensive to, to ship over and it's the leaf tip from the Sancho pepper plant. And it's usually just used as as a aesthetically pleasing garnish that people don't eat. When, when you see the big sashimi platters, there's obviously a lot of kind of mooly ribbons and shiso leaves and kinomi. And I remember just uh, e eating it and I was like, wow, it was simultaneously fragrant, but a little bit hot as well. And it tasted exotic and I'd never had it, anything like it before. Uh, so that was, that was, um, Probably the singular ingredient that we don't we don't use it in a lot of things, but it, people always remark about it when they have it. Could you talk us through the way, for example, just talk me about tell me about one dish yeah. that you use and you you put Japanese ingredients perhaps inside it, but you're not trying to say this is a Japanese dish or all you're trying to do is this is a this is a high dish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A great example is a dish that we have on at the moment. That's a tuna tartare. So we take uh, the best bluefin tuna from the Mediterranean, we take the otoro, so the, the fatty part of the belly, which is the most indulgent to eat. Um, the thing that I like about great sushi is, is that the rice is still warm and it, it just warms the fish a little bit. So that fat content becomes even more indulgent. So what we do here, we make the tuna tartare, we mix it with some aged soy. Uh, it's a koji soy that we use, some sushi vinegar, and uh, we serve it on top of some warm barley that we cook a little bit like sushi rice. We serve it all in a warm bowl and with a wooden spoon. So this kind of makes the diner lift the bowl, uh, eat with a wooden spoon. So the whole experience is very comforting, but it's very clean flavors. And uh, I think it's a great example of, of using some you know, more European ingredients, such as the, the barley. Um, the tuna, we have nasturtium as well that gives a lovely heat, not dissimilar to maybe adding wasabi. Um, but it's resolutely a high dish. And there's influences obviously from, from Japan, but it's not trying to mimic it. So you've got, you've got more dimensions mm. than just flavor, really, you're telling me about here. You're saying that rather than it being a hot dish or a cold dish, you've got a temperature that, that gives it a dimension. You've got a textural dimension from the food, but also the, the tableware as yeah. well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a multi-dimensional thing and the, the Japanese ingredients is just one of these dimensions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it all adds, it all comes together. I think the best dishes feel almost preordained and this one definitely does. I hope you all agree when you, when you eat it later.
you said about the texture of the Otoro being mm. quite chunky. Mm. And I think that that's really nice against the the pearl ball is quite small and bouncy. Yeah. So it doesn't get lost mm. and like wrapped around the barley and a mush. It's it's nice that it stands up to mm. its on itself on its own. You get that lovely rounded savouriness that we're talking about from the the dashi vinegar and from the koji soy, then it's punctuated with that, that piquancy from the uh, the nasturtium leaf. And again, with the, the nori that's cooked into the barley, mm. you've obviously got the flavor going all the way through mm. it, but then every now and again, you do get a piece of nori. Mm. And again, when you're eating a, a, maybe a maki roll, mm. you're getting that similar yeah. sort of, yeah. in my mind, you know, obviously being a bit biased towards Japanese food, mm. it just gives me those memories yeah, of a really yeah. good, Definitely, a good yeah. tuna roll. And with, with the barley having like quite a lot more bounce than rice, actually does, when yeah. you have a really nice rice, often it does have a really good mm. bounce to it. Yeah. So it, again, it's giving me those yeah. feelings. It's nice as well by going with barley, you sort of disassociate a little bit. It's nice using a, a British grain, but treating mm. it in a little bit of an oriental manner and uh, just give something a little bit, little bit different. It's not, like I said, it's safe. It's, a bit of a homage to sushi without it trying to mimic it. It's fantastic. 